Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right. Welcome. Welcome, Kayla. Thank you. I'm sitting here with Kayla Haber Goldstein. Yep. Okay. So let's uh, let the audience know exactly how uh, this conversation came to be. So in the last several months, uh, there's been a fair amount of talk in the community about the Aguna crisis. And uh, someone who's a fan of the podcast reached out to me and said, you're the person to talk to about said crisis. Not if I'm the person to talk to. I'm one of the people to talk to. Okay. Well, you're yeah. the person we're talking to now. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's how that came to be. Um, I don't know much about it personally. I, I hear things, obviously, but I've never met someone, known someone well who is trapped. I, I haven't personally been involved with this too much, but on the periphery, I've seen um, a fair amount of noise about it, so I'd love to, uh, to hear your take. Like what the issue is? Yeah, before we go there, talk about how you got into this, this work. What's your personal connection to it? So I run an organization called Questioning the Answers, which I wrote a book based on my own personal journey. So um, when I was 23, like when my son was born, I went on a journey where I kind of dropped Judaism and religion and then slowly through asking a lot of questions, I brought it back. Cool. So I where did you grow up? Israel. Right. And in terms of the the specific sect? Um, you Haredi. Haredi. Yeah, so. I grew up Haredi. My father is a big rav there. Oh, cool. Um, and when we moved to America... I had my son after we moved here and it was just, it was a very hard time and just keeping mitzvot was not part of, it was just not even a priority. And then slowly as I asked questions and found answers, I slowly one at a time started bringing things back as, as they meant something to me and in the way that they meant something to me. So not necessarily the same as I grew up, but still more meaningful. Um, and the whole time I was taking notes, this was like a two year process and I was taking notes and friends started asking me for the notes. I opened an Instagram account because I was curious if I, if there were other people who had questions that I can like also like try and figure out. And it became a lot of notes. A lot of people asked me for them and eventually I published the notes into a book. Oh, cool. Called Questioning the Answers. Called Questioning the Answers. And then from that, an organization. So the called. Instagram account stayed, and it became a place where people would come and ask questions that they couldn't find the answer to or that seemed like it didn't make sense in Judaism or like they couldn't, they couldn't match up. Like their own belief system with the Torah's belief system just didn't match up. Like something didn't make sense. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I started getting like this giant influx of questions of like, how is it possible that Hashem allows women to suffer like this? Like, how is it possible? How is it possible? So I went on Instagram and I realized that Dalia Uziel was posting about Free Chava, which was this like massive campaign to free a specific Aguna, which became a campaign to free all Agunot, which was to raise awareness for Agunot. And Chava is still not free. But because of her, a lot of women became free. And because of her, a lot of people were asking me, how is it possible that Hashem allows for this? And I was like, well, it's a really good question. I don't know. So I started learning about it. And when I started learning, I, I'm married to a rabbi. My father's a rabbi and most of my brothers are rabbis. I, I have a lot of like ability to learn. I, my husband taught me how to learn and I have a lot of people I can reach out to for help. So I kind of like have that support, which is why I, I use it to give it to other people. So I started learning. I learned with my brother. I learned with a Rav, like what's going on. And it came out that it's, it's not, Hashem is not okay with it actually. And it's actually completely usher to do this. And there's actually ways to free these women. And I was just, and there's things that the community is supposed to be doing. And I was just like shocked. I was like, okay, okay. So let's, let's hold before we get there in terms of the questioning the answers before it got to, the Aguna, Aguna crisis yeah. itself. Can you give another example or two of a question you wrestled with, an answer that others had given you that was unacceptable, questioning that answer and then coming with a new answer? Can right. you take us through an example of that journey? Um, well, like, for example, like Shabbos, right? We don't do it because Hashem told us not to do it. Like, I was raised, it's like Shabbos was, I wasn't really, I never really asked questions growing up. It wasn't like, 
I, if I would have, I probably would have gotten answers that I liked. It was more just like, this is what we do. So this is what we do. And it was very like, we keep Shabbos because Hashem told us to keep Shabbos. So we keep Shabbos. When it became really hard to keep Shabbos, because like I was with two tiny babies at home alone all day, um, I started looking into why should I keep Shabbos? And all of a sudden I learned all about like the organus and the light that comes in and how we, our job is to uncover the aura in the world and to bring spirituality into the physical. And in order to do that, we have to know what spirituality looks like. So we get a sampling once a week. And if we stop creating for 24 hours, then during those 24 hours, we go from creating to receiving. And then we take what we received and we infuse it into the world through creating, through creativity. So slow down a little bit. I know. <laughs> right. You used, you used a I few. He- very fast. <laughs> <laughs> you used a few Hebrew words over there. So just in case there's some listeners that aren't familiar with those words, um, we'll translate. So you spoke about on Shabbos, there's an organ who's a hidden light. It's like that, the hidden light that God created the world with. Right. The world it's was started with light. this light. Yeah. And then Shabbos is an opportunity to bring some of that light in the world. Well, it's our job as humans to bring that light into the physical world like that's the completion of the world is when humans infuse that light into the world god couldn't do that it had to be a human because we have to accept him as our king and it, he can't do that for us right god could do that but he set it up in such a way that he right 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 well yeah so we're his when we're tasked that. with like when we're tasked with like going and and infusing this light we do it by creating we were, it's, women do it by creating. We, by tapping into our creativity, we can then go and infuse spirituality into the physical. When we, but how? But we can't do that if we don't know what spirituality looks like. If we don't know what that light is, if we don't, we don't have any frame of reference to what we're supposed to be doing. So Hashem gave us Shabbos. On Shabbos, we don't create, right? We don't do anything that builds. We don't create. We don't write. We don't cook. We receive the light. We just experience God, and then we have a sampling of that to take us through the week. And we infuse that into the world until it runs out. Then we have another Shabbos. I was never taught that as a kid. If I would have asked my dad, he probably would have told me. But I was never taught that. So, so what's so what's the breakthrough there? Previously, I want to make sure that re, I'll repeat it back, and you tell me if I captured your thoughts correctly. So previously, th- your reason for doing Shabbos was because God said so, and it may have well just been a completely arbitrary instruction. Just do this Which for... became very burdensome exactly. at a certain point. Yeah. And at some point in time, you realize that, no, this is beneficial for myself, for my family, and for the world. Yeah, just mostly for myself. Like I was like, oh, I want that light. Like, I want that. And the second I create, I, I kind of like shut off the faucet. So like, why would I want to do that? So it became like, I wanted to keep Shabbos. It wasn't and, a question anymore. And this idea... Um, it's definitely like Chabad Judaism is filled, Chabad philosophy is filled with this concept of doing something simply because God said so. Yeah, a lot of people ask me that. I don't I don't think we were meant to. I think there are very few things that we were meant to do just because God said so, and that's to prove our faith. But I, Hashem gave us the Torah. He didn't, he didn't, he gave us free choice. He gave us like the option to think. He gave us a cerebral mind. He gave us Chabad. Right. Chabad is Chachma Vinadas. It's the it's the ability to think. That's what those. That's the first three spherot, The first three like attributes that God created the world with were intelligence. Right. I'll tell you my understanding of it. You tell me what you think. So there's two parts to it. One is yes, we're doing something because God said so, which is true. But there's also this belief that it's good for us meaning right. there's two separate things sometimes we don't know our we don't know god's ways we don't know everything sure. so it would it wouldn't be possible to suggest it wouldn't make a lot of sense to suggest that god gave us an instruction that was completely arbitrary like it would have to make sense on some level right and if you're like you know pure enough i'm sure that people keep shabbos and they don't care why they're like hashem told me to i'm gonna keep it but for me, I needed a better reason. I wasn't right. at that level of faith. Right. I mean, there's a level at which that could be enough, meaning I trust God that this is good for me. It's enough for my sister. When my book came out, my sister was like, she was so troubled by my book. And we're really, really close. And she couldn't, 
figure it out. She was like, I don't understand. We don't, we don't question. We, we just believe. We know that Hashem loves. I don't understand why you're asking these questions. Like we she definitely question. She couldn't wrap her head. Or, she was like, I don't understand. Like, we, why can't you just believe that God wants what's best for you and do what he says? Why do you have to understand why God told you to do something? Just do it. We definitely question. That's our way. No, not everybody. Some people are on a no, level no, but the of Jewish, no, faith. The, the, Jewish, they, the Jewish way is 100% the question. There's, that's what I because, think. <laughs> because the, the question, and the, well, there's two kinds of questions, meaning we can ask a question expecting there to be an answer, and then when that answer comes, right. then it, it strengthens what's there. And I, the, the kind of the rubber meets the road is while you're on the search, what do you do? Right? That's kind of... Or maybe not while you're on the, the search, because there could be other factors that play into that. But it's, do you always need to understand? Meaning there's a there's a limit to understanding. And, you sound like my husband. What? Like, you sound like my husband. He's always like, oh my gosh, just accept, just for once, just accept something. Just don't, you don't have to question everything. It's my, my brain. I like to question everything. Other people don't. Like it's, I think it's a type. Well, it's I, good to I question, question everything. everything also not in Judaism. So let's take, talk about, say, shotness as an example, right? So shotness is known, again, Chabad philosophy. We're taught over and over the Chabad that you're familiar with. Are the, you Chabad? I grew up Chabad. You're familiar with the three kinds of mitzvahs? Like um, myself, God, and others? No, Chukim, Edim, Mishpatim, or something like that. Okay. Right, so you're familiar with this? Okay, it's three types. I so, know Chukim, but I didn't know the other one. Ironic. Okay, so I'll go in the reverse, though. So you have mishpatim are laws, right? Laws are things that we would probably conclude were it not for the Torah. And things like don't kill, don't steal. Okay. Like and they you, make sense. More than make sense. We would conclude that. Like we, we would most likely, there's a concept in the Gemara that were it not for the Torah, we would learn a lot from animals about how to live. An example, we would learn modesty from a cat. We would learn... I don't know, maybe resourcefulness from a bird, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever. right? The concept is we would learn a lot about how to live from nature and from other, from our minds, from what makes the most sense. We don't need to be taught that preserving life is a good, is a good thing for most of us. And then we can say, okay, how do we best preserve life? Well, if we don't kill each other, if we don't steal. So like it's, we would have come to the same conclusion even if we didn't have the Torah. Y yes, not 100%, meaning U.S. law is different than um, Torah law, but there's a lot of overlap. And right. even within U.S. law, you can have different states have laws. And, um, but still, no, nobody's Right, the okay concept that they exist. Right. right, the concept that they exist, like these laws, that's one level of it, is there's laws. The second is would be Adem, which would be, let's say, Passover. We keep Passover because we left Egypt, and so for eight days we're going to do Passover. So it's like witnessing. So we would never know it. But as soon as it's told to us, then we say, okay, this is what we're going to do in commemoration of that. So it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then you have the third category, which is chukim, which is um, there is no reason. Which is the only one I knew. Right. There's no reason given. Right. Okay. Right. That's why I said <laughs> ironic that it's the only one you know. It doesn't make much sense. But okay. And the example that was always given to us, the two that like Chabab always heard about was paraduma, right? That uh, it says when the Shiach comes, there's something like, that. I guess, uh, an animal slaughtered. That's a red, the red heifer, right? The red cow and it has to be completely red. Why? We're not told a reason. And the second is shotness. That was another one. Why not mix wool and linen? Mm -hmm. And that also would appear to be arbitrary. But my understanding of that, or at least the way it is today, is not that they're actually arbitrary. It's that the reason wasn't communicated to us. And I'll give you an example of this. I think that there is a reason for of it. Of course though. there's a reason for it. But the reason was not necessarily communicated because to us. Because the point wasn't for us to it. know the reason. Meaning there are some things that, like, even Shabbos is considered that like the hallmark of a Jew is if they keep Shabbos or not. Okay. Because it doesn't make sense, and like that's it's like a it's like a sign of faith. It's like a proof of accepting God as your King when you stop everything for twenty four hours, no matter what. It's like I'm I don't owe anything. Like when our grandfathers came in to America and they stopped working every single Saturday and lost their job every single Saturday. It's like a way of saying like I owe only I only have one King, I only have one boss um and it's like a, sh a sign of faith like it's not necessarily about like why god chose this and that it's more like a, just a sign of like i accept you as my king sure but i recently um started being much more careful with shabbos in the last couple of years 
And while I maybe started, I don't know, out of curiosity or out of whatever, some inspiration, at this point in time, I, I see the benefit. I reap the, I reap the rewards in my life. Yeah. I'm very happy. It's much better. About Shabbos. I don't yeah. know how people live without it. <laughs> right, exactly. I That's what I'm saying. Right. So the benefit will be realized, meaning you're not, you and I are not doing it on simple faith anymore. Right, but shotness is not realized, you're saying. Like, you, there's no right. real reason. The, w- the way I was taught, and again, I keep referencing Chabad philosophy, is that although there's three categories, each category is meant to teach us something about the other category, meaning um, certainly chukim is meant to, that idea of we're doing something on simple faith becomes infused in the things, even though we found a reason, meaning there's many aspects of Shabbos that make sense to us, and then there's probably a level, and there's definitely, there are levels at which it's impacting us and impacting the world that we have to take on simple faith. Right. So doing it from the aspect of simple faith is the correct way to do it, even though this one, we have a lot of reasons to do it. That makes sense. I like that. That makes okay. sense. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I love Wait. Chabad. Chabad, I, I connect very much to Chabad. My rabbit sends Chabad. It's interesting how you um, affirmed it, though. You said it makes sense. It makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meaning you went back sense. to the brain, right? It makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah. When? That's true. I do do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. That's okay, true. good. So we... That's, that's like how I got started. That was my book. And then we moved into... Like... But I want to go back to the debate between you and your sister a little bit. So she was saying that it's not... Oh. What? <laughs> <laughs> she was saying that it's not the way to question, but it is. Like your I mean, Shabbos... now she agrees with me. Okay, right. Your shop is definitely... Mostly because her daughter read my book. I got it. And she, uh, she bought it. Yeah. She has my kind of brain. <laughs> got it. But when, when you go through the process of questioning and answering, and then you resolve it in some way, it becomes strengthened. It's like a... Um... Yeah, no. The way that I keep the Torah now is a thousand times much stronger and better than the way that I kept it as a kid. I kept it as a kid because I had to, and I pushed every single limit. And, and it I felt like a it. burden. I hated it. Right. I didn't connect to Hashem through it at all. I didn't connect to Hashem. And then now I feel like I have a relationship with him. I keep it for a good reason. It enhances my life. And when my kids are having a hard time, I have what to tell them. And I feel like hopefully be able to give them the opportunity to be from religious or whatever in a way that's actually meaningful to them, not in just because this is what we do. Right. Right, so maybe we should kind of encapsulate the thought like this, is you want to there's know always a good reason, it, there's my, always a good reason, go ahead. Say. My husband says it like this, he's like, if, you're, if you are looking at a painting really, really close up, and all you see is black, but you zoom out, and you see that it's a beautiful painting, and you zoom back in, in like a more colorful area, or an area that speaks to you more, that's like what we're doing. We're born into a certain part of the painting, but we're allowed to zoom out and zoom back in into a part of the painting that is more meaningful to us. So even though the zooming out looks like maybe it's not a good thing and maybe you're walking away, maybe you should just have simple faith and all of that, you can come back and come back to the simple faith at the end. But the, the journey is what's going to make you actually feel, feel that connection and connect to the painting. Right, I agree. With that. I like that. Uh, painting is I like that analogy. That's what Chava did in Gan Eden when she ate from the, from the fruit. She what? That she did it on purpose. She knew. But she said that the journey of going away and coming back would, be, would make our connection to Hashem so much stronger that it was worth it. She wanted her children to have that journey. You know who mm-hmm. said that? Um, sounds like a Chabad concept. Ramanus Friedman. Okay, yeah, it sounds like a Chabad yeah. concept. Chabad has a way of um, Chabad philosophy. Making everything beautiful. Everything's positive. Everything is positive. I know, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's fine. So to, just to encapsulate the idea, at least from my perspective, is that there is a good reason to do it all, but sometimes we don't know that reason yet. Right. But we definitely are meant to believe that there is a good reason to do it, and it will bring good to us, to our families, and to the world. Right. My book has chapters. The first chapter is understanding the creator. The second chapter is understanding the Torah. And only then it goes into understanding all the little details and the mitzvahs and everything. But first, before you do that, you have to first believe in God and you have to believe in the Torah. Otherwise, there's like a foundation you have to have there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think the search is, I mean, certainly here. I mean, we call this in search of more, right? 
what is that search if not questioning and answering yeah. and debating? Yeah, for yeah. sure. And in that process, we we pull out the juice, we pull out the sweetness. Yeah, I just don't see how anyone can um, accuse Judaism of not questioning. In the Talmud, this is literally what it is. Every single Did aspect of Did you ever go detail. to Israel and hang out in the Haredi community? What happens there? Don't ask questions. Oh, you're not allowed to ask questions? No. Definitely okay. not. Okay. Not maybe. even a little bit, no. Maybe they've um, deviated a little from Judaism. What do I know? I think it's just fair. I think that there was assimilation. I mean, I don't think. I know. I did the research. There was a lot of assimilation. And as a method of being, of controlling the assimilation, there became a method of control of just like getting stricter and stricter and stricter to hold people in. Right. That makes sense. Like brute survival strategy. But that's certainly yeah. not what we're after. Ken Spiro talks about it a lot. Who? Ken Spiro. Spiro? Ken Spiro. Spiro. That's right. I, don't I, know. I read his name. I didn't hear it. But he he's a historian. And he talks about it a lot, about how like it was like the communities in like pre-war Europe that they got like very, very tight because they were scared of assimilation, but it didn't really Right, it was help. essentially survival. Yeah. Right, it's like a, a family hiding. But now we don't need that anymore. Right, it's a family hiding in a bunker telling their kids don't speak. Why? Because don't make it too much noise so the enemy doesn't find out we're exactly. here. Exactly, but, exactly. You know. But like we're not Now there. we're living in a beautiful place and we're still telling our kids not to speak. Right. Right, so. Okay, good. So questions, answers, you get into this whole, um, I guess, field. You put out an account. A lot of questions are coming your way. And then people are questioning, how does God allow agunas? And that question is actually fairly strong because I guess the implication of the question is that it's not how does it's God God's allow loss. Agunas. Yeah, it's not how does God allow agunas. You can ask how does God allow you know, this Hamas terrorist attack. No, no, this is different. This, this is, is different. God's this laws. is like, how is the Torah giving space for this abuse? Like, how come these men are keeping the Torah and the Torah doesn't give her a way out? Right, that's what I'm saying. Meaning right. it's not... It's not that Hashem allowed for it. It's more that Hashem almost created Instructed it. it. Yeah. Right, that's what it seems like. Yeah, it seems like it, but it's not true. Right, it seems almost barbaric. Yeah. It seems, it's, it seems pretty abusive. It seems like God doesn't care about women. Right. I, not that the men are doing so well either, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> In this topic. <laughs> right. Um, no, but it's not true. At okay, all. so what did you find in this? Uh... So I found, first of all, that the whole concept of like Kiddushin and, you know, saying that the, having a chuppah, having a ksuba. Actually, let's, whole... let's, let's go back one more time before we go back in. Okay. Um, so to someone who doesn't understand this concept, right? Okay. At all that Judaism marriages and divorces are slightly different. Can you explain the way it's practiced? Before we go into the laws and everything else, explain the way it's practiced today. Well, the way that it's practiced today in religious circles, for the majority, obviously everybody... Mm -hmm. Two Jews, um, three opinions. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, they get you... We, we don't have any like relations until we get married. And then when we get married... We only have relations with that person and we are committed to each other. We get married under a ceremony where there are 10 witnesses and we sign a prenup under the, under the chuppah, this ceremony. And then we live together. The prenup is what? The ksuba is a prenup. Say more. The ksuba basically just says what he's going to give her. And if he doesn't give her, what she's going to get if, they, if the ksuba, if they get divorced. Okay. Do you ever read the ksuba? <laughs> you should read it it's fascinating because everybody's like oh it's a prenup it, it's a prenup everybody's like oh how could you do like prenup halachic prenup like this is a prenup it's like the, the rabbis in the Gemara created it so wait let me back up so we we live together and then hopefully everything's great and you have children and you're happy and all's lovely but let's say you want to get divorced according to Jewish law a husband has to give his wife a document saying I'm no longer sleeping with you now you can go sleep with other people. And the reason for it was because of parental lineage. There was like a confusion of who the dad was. So they, it became a reason to give this divorce. This bill of divorce was so that she can now go be with other men. And if there's a pregnancy, we know it's not his because he signed a paper that he's no longer sleeping with her. That's, that's how it started. That's what it is. That's literally what it is. And um, eventually, what happened was is that... Um, People, you know, originally there was no marriage. They were just raping women and discarding them. This was before the Torah. Like, back, back, back. Um, the what Torah are they called? Said, the Stone Age? The Stone Age. Whatever. The cavemen? Like, okay. Yeah. 
Um, and then God's like, and then once a woman was raped, there was no, she was like second, she was like used goods. She was like damaged goods. So the Torah came along and said, you can't do that. You have to provide for her. If you're going to sleep with her, you have to give her food. You have to give her shelter. You have to give her clothes. You have to provide for her. You can't just like leave her. Um, so men were coming and saying like, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to provide for you. I'll give you all those things, sleeping with her and then leaving, not doing anything they promised. So the rabbis came along and created something called a chuppah and, and they had a ceremony where he had to give, he had to promise her these things in front of 10 witnesses, in front of two witnesses and 10 people so that, um, everybody would know like no you promised this to her and you have to fulfill that promise at the time though he was allowed to marry more than one woman as long as he was able to fulfill those promises as long as he was wealthy enough or strong enough or whatever to fulfill these promises he was able to marry as many women as he wanted um but then what happened was was that men were getting married saying that they'll provide for these women and maybe they were providing for them but they were leaving and the woman would be stuck so then they said, okay, you have to, you have to sign that you're not married, that you're not married to her anymore. Um, and you have to like, let her go find another man. So then along came the get. So now men are like, so it, it, basically it's like. You're saying this is all rabbinic. All rabbinic. All, you could read it in the Gemara, the Torah, the Gemara. You could read it in history. So this, what keeps on repeating itself is that there's like women that for some reason, it's a whole other topic Hashem created that like, you know, second class citizens in, in how the world was created, like originally, right? Like if you go back to medieval times, women were not treated well. So like back in, if you go all the way back, 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 this is how Hashem, whatever. It's a whole nother conversation of why that happened. But constantly the rabbis are trying to even the playing field. Like our, our leaders and our sages were constantly trying to help even the, la the playing field and constantly the men were like finding a way around it because men have, that's their Yetzirah. That's like, this is the area where the Yitzhara is the strongest. So they were like constantly trying to work With around. With sexualities. Yeah. Okay. And not being monogamous and not providing for their woman the way they should be providing for their woman. This is all like, obviously, I'm sure there were a lot of amazing men. This is like a problem that was happening for some people. So then what happened was, is that there was the, the exile and we got dispersed and the Sanhedrin got you know, this council of rabbis who made all these laws got disbanded and we couldn't evolve. We couldn't create any more laws. And while we can do it a little bit, we have the Shulchan Aruch, we have the Mishnah Bura, we have Moshe Feinstein, it's not on the same level. So we got stuck there. And now we have a situation where there's a woman who wants to get divorced and she can get divorced, but she can't remarry unless she has this bill from her, this, this document from her husband saying that I'm no longer sleeping with you. And a lot of men nowadays are using that either as a method of domestic abuse just just because they want to cause her pain or because they want her to come back or because they want money or custody of the children or something that they're using it as a bargaining chip like a bargaining tool yeah. and the gemara this was an issue already back then and the gemara gave solutions of ways to annul marriages of ways to give the get on his behalf of ways to force the get we don't do any of those things because so those have kind of fallen out of vogue for whatever reason. Those fell out and of the vogue one that... through history. And the one that stayed was that if we have permission and there's enough reason to force a man to give a get, we can force him to give it. But there's no real way that we like kind of give her the divorce, give her the permission to go get remarried without him. And this term, aguna, is something that kind of has been borrowed. It's been given to these women, but it's not the original. The original was when a man was lost at war at sea. He was lost, and we didn't know where he was, and we couldn't. We don't know if he's coming back. We didn't know if he was coming back, so she right. couldn't you know remarry. If he's alive she or was dead. like in okay. this like limbo. Nowadays, like we don't really have that issue. It's 2023. We know where everyone is, unfortunately, <laughs> and we really like we really know everything about everyone. So nowadays it's kind of been transferred to this, to this case of a woman who is neither here nor there because she's not married. She's not living with him. They're not married in any way, but he, she can't get remarried because he won't give her this like permission, so to speak. That's the issue. <laughs> but I understand. So your thought process, let me make sure I understand it, is that let's say we, this the concept of get was originally developed in order to protect women. Well, it it was no. It's written in the Torah that he has to say that he's not 
that he's like a star. I think it's called a star kritut or something. It's not. It's written in the Torah that he has to give her some sort of document. Um, the rabbis, it, it became a problem when the rabbis would say, "You have to give her a get." They would make the man give her a get. If she asked for it, they, they he would have to give it to her before the sunset that day. Like if she wanted to get, if she wanted to move on and he didn't want to, like the rabbis would and became a concept of saying, you have to give her this document. Let's say because you're never home, because you're not providing for her the way you should be, because you're taking on too many wives and you can't afford it, um, because she wants one, because like literally because you have BO. There's one of the reasons in the Gemara, if, if she says he smells bad, then he has to give her a divorce. Like a woman cannot ever be forced to be with a man she doesn't want to be with. The Torah protects women. The Torah says no, and and if a woman, if a man wants to give a woman a get, according to the Torah, and she doesn't want to accept one, you're not allowed to make her accept it. You're not allowed to force her. You're not even allowed to ask her why. If a woman is not interested. If she wants to stay married and he wants to get divorced, there's no halachic way to free him. The only way is heter marabanim. Why? Because he's still married to her. He's just taking on a second wife. One second. If she doesn't want to get divorced. Let's say that there's a situation. You're saying, she, a man, you're saying a man can't back out because he already made a promise. He can't back out unless she lets him back out. Halachically. Not culturally, society, how we actually practice is different. But halachically, if he wants to leave the marriage and she says no because of financial reasons or whatever, he's not allowed, to, he's not allowed out of the marriage. Because she he already made the power. promise. Yeah, because you can't just ditch her. Hashem like protects women so much and right. then the culture and society is like fighting against that which is just how everything in the world works the Hashem says one thing and then the society wants something else and then there's like a fight okay so your your conclusion has been that um the Torah in fact is tremendously compassionate towards women and yeah. were it not for the Torah then we'd be in an age of women being raped and discarded. We wouldn't because of what you said about the mishpatim. We're like, socially, we've evolved past that. And even in non-Jewish world, people are not allowed to do that. Right. Uh, however, it is hard to, to separate um, kind of where the world would be without Judaism. Meaning, right. while I did make that point, it certainly wouldn't be at the same level of right. development, right? Right, 100%. The Torah did introduce certain concepts and they've become for example in america it's you'll you'll hear a lot about judeo christian values right well christian values don't exist without judeo values right it's a continuation it's a, of judaism it's so it's judaism. right so all of these values that we talk about were started with ju with judaism you know the like the way i've heard this said which i like is you can cut a flower from its like from its roots and for a while it'll still talk about its beauty you know for a week or two, it can still look like a beautiful flower and forget that it's disconnected right, right, from right. Its, life, right. its life source and it'll eventually wither and die. So it's kind of the same idea is that the world can talk about all of our wonderful lessons and push Judaism to the side. But all of, all of its wonderful wisdom and knowledge and development and push Judaism to the side, but it may be the flower that's cut from the earth. Right. The, the, the root was the Torah. The Torah was the first, like, ethics and moral code that was given to the world. Right. I'm not 100% sure that's, um, like, all historians agree. I, I do believe I heard from someone, I was someone on this podcast, who spoke about it and said that prior to Judaism, there was something called Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian, something like that. And that was the first monotheistic, historically. But I know within cool. Judaism, I don't think we say that. We say that Abraham was the first well, now I'm gonna go look monotheist. Up but worth Torah. looking at, again, it's... The the even with that concept, most people have no idea what Zoroastri. I, I never barely, heard of it before. Right, I can barely pronounce pronounce it. So not barely, I can't pronounce it. I'm gonna so, look it up after. I have to. Know in terms it. of its impact, it could have been some guy, right. um, in a uh, in, in a cave. Right. Judaism well, did do a pretty good job of we, getting its message out to the world. So like, let's say that there was no Torah and we were still in the Stone Age, and according to the yes. Torah, women would be treated. Without the Torah, women would be treated right. So, much right. Worse. I was only making one point. There was that your original question was how can the Torah be so barbaric? Because we're looking and saying, hey, in American society or in any developed country, a woman is not ending up in this place of being completely trapped. And you're kind of saying, hold on, were it not for the Torah at all, women would be raped and discarded, and that would be everyone. Okay. Right. So now we have that. Unfortunately, we have human nature. We got stuck. Right, we have human nature, and human nature has always been to find 
a way around the rule, and the Rabbanim have done that over the years, which is mm -hmm. to figure out, okay, the Torah was put out there, but people always find ways around things. It's not that people find ways around it. First of all, the Torah was given to people to evolve. The Gemara talks about how the Torah was written to the generation that received it. That it was written to the generation in the desert because if God would have written what the ultimate goal was, they wouldn't have been able to receive it because they were so far removed from it. It had to be just one step. And it's our job every generation to go another step and another step until we reach Mashiach. Where's the source for this? In the Gemara. Oh, really? Yeah, it's cool. over 200 times. It says, Dibre HaKatuv Ba'oveh in the Gemara. Dibre? Dibre HaKatuv Ba'oveh. The, the Torah spoke to that generation. The Torah oh, okay, you're translating time. like that. So it's our job to evolve. It's our job, and that's why the, the Torah was given to people, and that's why people have constantly been evolving it with the, with the oral Torah, and then the Mishnah, and then the Gemara, and then the right. Rambam. Right, but there's also evolution evolved. and the opposite, right? Sometimes we, we go... I don't believe in it. I don't believe in Yeri Data Dolot. Not true. <laughs> we're farther from prophecy, but we're not farther from the truth. We still keep the Torah. We still keep everything that we're supposed to be keeping, if not better. If not with more understanding. Yaakov, of course, would disagree with you. but <laughs> Well... I hear. Listen, two Jews, three opinions. It's fine. Um... <laughs> You can see, let's let's say practically, right? Um, as far as Jews are concerned, we're recording this a little bit after um, the attacks in Israel, and it seems it certainly seems like we found another way to rationalize killing a lot of Jews. Meaning, for a lot of the world, meaning the world, found the world a has found a lot of ways to rationalize killing a lot of Jews. So, it's if that's not a descent from where the world was in 1946, um, what the world. What do you mean? When Hitler tried to rationalize killing Jews, everybody agreed with him and jumped on board. Correct, until they saw what he actually meant. Meaning until they... When... You know, like, the people have always been okay with killing Jews. All people? Well, all people aren't okay with killing Jews now. The That's same true. same percentage of people. Well, but I'm saying something different. So, October 7th, right, was when um, the attack happened in Israel. October 8th, a lot of people were horrified. Right. Today we're recording this. Maybe it's October 24th, I think. I don't know. Something <laughs> like that. Can we get a date check? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's October 20-something. 20 20 yeah. 25th. 25th. So it's October 25th. And some of the same people who were horrified on October 8th are somehow not so sure right. anymore. That's what I'm seeing. That's somehow not so sure. That's what I meant by... Um, as one example of Yerida Hador, right, that sometimes that over time we, we can evolve and we can go in the opposite direction. You can see someone who's, you meet them two years later and they're doing better than they were and you meet them two years later or someone else may meet them two years it later doing worse than they were. Ways. Yeah, I certainly think we can. So maybe Yerida Hador is just is. not like, it can't, it's not like a general thing. Like maybe there's some people who are going, going closer and there's some people are, who are going further away and it's not a general thing. It's more of a personal thing. Like, we have a choice which one we're going to be. Yeah, 100%. That's what I'm saying. The concept of free choice that we'd have to say that it can be going in in either direction. Definitely. Okay. But I hear, the, I hear that the Torah definitely needs to be made Adapted. practical to, to the world and what's going on. Yeah. And the Torah gives right us now. 13 ways to do that. There's, there's like a bunch of rules. To, that you're allowed to adapt and evolve the Torah as long as you're staying within these parameters. And like you can't directly contradict the Torah. You can't get more strict than the Torah. There's like a whole bunch of rules that were given from Moshe and they were written down in Ambrisa and like we know exactly how to do it. We you can't just you can't you can't just like wake up one day and be like, well, this I decided the Torah meant this. Like there has to be some sort of process. You have to have like a something you're building on that built on that connects to Moshe Rabbeinu. There's a whole list of things that has to like fall into. Right. And that would be the case. Right. And that would be the case with, with anything, right? You have the yeah. U.S. Constitution yeah. and then you have amendments yeah. and, you know, you keep going. Exactly. Right. You have to find precedents. What? You have to find the precedent. Yeah. And then you may need a two thirds vote, right? You can't just have one guy wake right. up in the morning and say this what doesn't work. For exactly. Me. But then you can't contradict some of the foundational things. Right. Understood. Um, okay. So... Fine. So you, basically your conclusion is, sum it up, is that it's not the Torah. The problem's not in the Torah. The problem is in human nature. Correct. 
especially what you would call the nature of man. I'm not like here to hate on men at all. <laughs> but, like that's not who I am at gotcha. all. It's just th in this particular area, men do seem to be the ones who are usually causing the pain. Right. There are some men who are trapped, but some it's usually the women who are trapped. Right. I mean, listen, we can be honest about it, um, even as a man, is that most killing are done by men. Most um, rapes are done by men. Most theft is done by it. men. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. There's no question that men... I mean, the world is mostly run by men. Most world leaders are men. Most, most presidents and prime ministers are men. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with run by. Well, led by, I guess. Right, because behind every one of these men, if they're married, is a woman who's running them. But True. I agree. You know, men are weaker for women than women are for men. Correct. Right, so That's there's... That's why I'm not trying to hate on men. Right, there's an inherent... Um, I do think that women can tear down a man really easily if they wanted to, and they do. So I'm, it's like... Very often. I'm, I'm, I'm an equalist. I believe in equal opportunity. And there, there's no question that... Um, Teenage girls are much meaner than teenage boys. Yeah. And um, for many of us who've... Also adult girls. Like what? also women. Women could Are be much women. meaner than men. Okay, that idea. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and um, many who've experienced having a female boss are not so upset that there aren't uh, more women in that, uh, right. in that place. Meaning there's... But in this specific topic, in this specific case, the men do have the power and they are abusive. Most Okay, well, so when you say they have power, why do you think they have the power? Well, they have to release her. They have to sign this document that she can go get remarried. And if they don't, she is trapped for the rest of her life and she doesn't have any control. He's literally di dictating her personal Okay, right, life. but that's, that's you're talking on a granular level, but in the concept of this, meaning the world being created from day one, why do you think men have more power than women on this subject? I don't think they do. I think it's been misunderstood. I think that women um, were created, Hashem created two types of energies in the world. Uh, one is like an uh, aggressive one and one is a calm one. And together, if you work together, it's like a spiral. You can go up. Um, and if you don't work together, I can, me being a calm this doesn't say all women are calm and all men are aggressive. It's it's just a, an energy, and it's in everything. There's always a plus and a minus in every energy. There's in in electricity, in like in any concept in science that you take. There's always a give and a take. There's always like a push and a pull, and you see it also in like when you ha like how children are created, right? Like there's always a give and a take, and I think that a woman is supposed to be like kind of grounded and a man is supposed to be like the go-getter like the hunter and the cook the one who cooks um and i think it's been misunderstood to say like women should be home women should be in the kitchen women should be quiet women should be in the background which is i don't think that's what god intended at all i think that it was just meant to be like if i want you to be like me then i'm going to hold you back and if you want me to be like you then you're going to take me out of my comfort zone and nobody's going to be grounded and we're not going to have any roots so we're not going to have any stability so it's just two different energies that are both equally necessary in this world in order to succeed. Like you have a heart and a brain. You need both of those to succeed. I think that because women were given this kind of like grounding while men were more aggressive, naturally you're creating this issue where if their aggression is turned towards each other, then he, he's going to hurt her. Right. There's also a practical, right, also a practical like evolutionary um, thing that's going on, right? A, a man and a woman, a man and a woman have sex, um, Hopefully they both enjoy it tremendously, and the man right, goes off, and the has woman has a to has a baby. Need to continue his li his lineage, meaning right. That's something else, but right practically, right after that act happens, yeah. Assuming it results in pregnancy, the man can go off and do his thing. He can go to war. He can travel. He can do whatever he wants, and the woman has a baby to care for in her belly for nine months, and then afterwards, um, she's not going to. Her life drastically changes. Exactly. Yours doesn't. Exactly. His doesn't. Yeah. And it can change from one day to the next. That man can go and can impregnate right. more women you the next day. This woman like can't be mistake. impregnated again. Like what? It could even happen by mistake. And then she's the one to bear the, sh the shame and Correct. the consequences of their actions Correct. while he's he technically could just pretend it didn't happen. Right. I mean, it's not a weakness. It's an inherent... Sh it's like just it's, the way right, it is. It's the global structure. It's, it's the way it's the, way it's the nature. created the world. Right. Is that one person has the 
primary responsibility of childbirth and child, not the, pri- the only responsibility of childbirth Creation. and the primary responsibility of child rearing. Mm-hmm. And the other, the guy's kind of optional in the process. Yeah. In that process there. And as a result, the woman has more to lose, right? When a, she also has more to gain, but she has more to lose also. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Right. So a woman is going to protect what she has. And she's uh, naturally, like, I, I keep saying these, like, global stereotypes. Obviously, every single woman, every single man is different. But m- and generally, a woman will protect what she has and will think 100 times and make sure that she's not going to get pregnant and make sure that she's protecting her own. While a man is kind of just more, like, focused on just, you know, having relations with a woman and just like getting done and he has this primal need to have children because it's not it if not a man would never have children meaning a woman has this like maternal instinct Mm -hmm. a man it's more about continuing his his legacy so a man is kind of like the aggressive one and he's kind of going for it and if you you have situations where a man can rape a woman or you have a situation where a man can marry a woman and not let her go like a man is given this kind of like He's supposed to use it to protect her. He's supposed to treat her like a queen. He's supposed to be serving her and going out and working to bring home money for her and and taking care of her and protecting her. Like he's not, you know, like supposed to be putting her in harm's way. She's supposed to be his entire life and he's supposed to hold her like a diamond and just like be absolutely insanely overprotective over her. But if you take that same energy and you flip it to a toxic energy, overprotective can mean you're not going to be with anyone else. You're only going to be with me. Overprotective can mean I want to sleep with you now, so I'm going to sleep with you now because you're mine. Overprotective can turn into controlling. It very can fast, be. That's what it you're can saying. become very toxic. But if it's done correctly, it can be very beautiful. Like, I don't know. I got not to get personal, but like I'm saying, like for me, I work because I want to work. My husband works because he has to. Because uh, he has to. Work. He has to work because it's his job to provide for us. While my husband's great, he helps at home and he takes care of the kids and he's amazing. But it's my job. At the end of the day, if I have something going on and he has something going on, one of our kids are sick, I'm going to cancel, not him, because my job is to take care of the kids. And for us, that works. That make, that because because we respect each other. Because he doesn't treat me like he owns me or like I'm his maid or like I'm his housekeeper. He treats me like he wants to protect me, and in turn, I want to I want to do things for him. Right. When it's done beautifully, it could be beautiful when it's done right, but it could also be turned into something really bad. I understand that. So. What you're saying makes sense. Um, however, you're referencing a lot of sources and tradition and history. So without going into um, every single one and asking you to point to the exact support because oh, it wouldn't be appropriate, is there a rabbi, that's a, an Orthodox rabbi, because that's what we're talking about, right? I mean, we're talking about Orthodoxy here because a lot of these issues have probably been settled um, in other factions of Judaism. Yeah, this is mostly an Orthodox issue. I mean, it is an Orthodox no, issue. No, it is an Orthodox issue. So is there an Orthodox rabbi respected on Orthodoxy who agrees pretty much, not every single thing you said, but agrees with your position? Is there uh, one you can speak to? Yeah, every rabbi I've spoken to agrees with me that this is what marriage was supposed to be. Okay, and... Like, okay, I could just give my father, because, like, he's the first one I think of, but, like, Perfect. he probably agrees. Hey, Rabbi Yaakov Haber. Meaning, what I'm saying is not, it's, I'm not making it up. I ha, it's, like, it, this is what Hashem wanted, right? Like, the Lubavitcher Rebbe even speaks about it. He said about how About how it's a man's duty to take care of his wife. It's not meant to, it's not meant to be that, you know, she should just go out and go crazy and work so hard, and he should be, like, chilling. It's his job to take care of her. Okay, I mean, that's... That's it's fine. It's pretty And sad. therefore what? Therefore, he will... Therefore. No, what you're saying is like this. What you're saying is that what's going on where men are not giving um, their wife who wants a divorce, a divorce, right? yeah. a Jewish divorce, is contrary to Judaism. That's what you're yeah. saying. And you reference a specific law that says that if a woman... Request a divorce that before the sun sets on that day. We don't hold like that anymore. But that's what it says. But it says that in the Gemara. Yeah. Okay. So what's happening, according to you, is a complete departure from Judaism. It's a perversion. I don't know if it's departure, but it's a perversion of what we were supposed to do. And it happened because we don't have anybody who's like really, we don't have a Sanhedrin. We don't have one leader. We don't have anybody who's really able to like 
take care of the whole Jewish community. We don't have like this like right centralization of Judaism anymore. So, so what are you suggesting as the as a solution? Because, I mean, the fact of the matter is, I mean, growing up, I heard many times about the concept of if a man does want to give his wife a divorce, you force him until he wants it. Yeah. Right. And up to and including beating him up physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we don't live in an environment where. We can do that, right? Someone can be in prison no, for theft. but you can force Someone a can man be... for something else. Like you, meaning like you can get him fired. You can... So there's two solutions, and it's twofold. It has to happen at the same time. One is society-based, and one is leadership-based. So the leaders have By to leadership, stand up. By leadership, you mean rabbinical leadership. Yeah. The okay. leaders have... Our rabbis have to stand up. They have to take control. They have to, you know, care about their congregants and their female congregants, and they have to do what they have to do. The society also has to get up because what happened was is that society has absolutely no idea what it means when someone's a gay refuser, what a sirav means, what a cher means, what are we... Most of the time, if you have a situation where there's a man who's refusing a get, if you mention it to somebody who can actually do something about it, I don't want to get involved, it's not my business, I don't know the full story, I need context. Like, and it's like, no, you don't need context because we have a system and we have Judaism and we have alachot and you're job is to do what the based in says so in your opinion context never matters for something no like context this. always matters but it's not the average person's job to find the context it's the based in's job to find the context if the based in which is a rabbinic court of law if they to say he needs to give her a get and we are proclaiming that he is a get refuser and he has a syrup against him and nobody is allowed to talk to him count him for a minion do business with him have him for shabbos meals or anything and then that goes out to the community. And the community goes, eh, I don't know. I have to think about it. I have to get context. I have to look into it. Then he's going to live absolutely scot free, like have everything he wants. And she's still stuck. And there's no way for the Basin to enforce the law. However, like Rabbi Yehoram Ullman, who's the of Basin in Australia, he says, he's like, in his community in Sydney, it's such a tight knit community that when he puts out a demand that, Look, we put pictures everywhere. This man, you cannot speak to him. You cannot say good job. You cannot. And within two weeks, the woman is released because they can't live like that. But when you live in a society where everybody is all of a sudden expert and everybody, nobody wants to get involved. And like we had a story where there was one person who she, um, we needed to pressure her. He, she was a relative of the guy and she runs daycares and it was like don't send to her daycare and i was speaking to a cousin of mine who sends there and i was like how can you send to her daycare and she was like well i don't know it's my business i don't care it's not my problem it's not my business like why am i getting involved in someone else's business it's like because it's your job because we're that's the way the jewish nation is is structured that we care about each other we take care of each other and if you are not going to stand up for your this woman no nobody can help her unless the rabbis stand up. So then there's the other solution, which is like a whole other, which is like the other side of it, where once you have the society doing it, the rabbis have to then do, they have to put the pressure. They have to be the ones who say, like, they have to take ownership and say, I looked at the context. He's a get refuser. This is what we're going to do to make him give a get. Okay, so what you're saying is that unless, unless there's a based in who's actually determined that this person is a get refuser, then... We shouldn't get excited just because someone calls him a get refuser. No, for sure not. You have to wait till a basin says it because a lot of women and men will claim that like the other person is a get refuser just because they want to get what they want. So can you talk like, to as that? as a manipulative tactic. There was a case somebody um, claimed that her husband was a get refuser. Um, look, it, this, I'm like jumping ahead a few steps, but right now I run something called the VOD, which is a group where basically we take care of these cases. I have calls like twice a day. I get a call from somebody asking me to take on their case. 20% of them are not real cases. They're just, and, and within talking to them, you can find out, no, I'm like, well, did you ever ask for a get? No, I'm not ready to ask for a get yet. First, I want to finalize the financials. First, I want to finalize this. First, I want to finalize that. He makes more money than he's claiming he's making, and I want to get more money out of him, so I'm not asking for a get yet because that will jeopardize my case. But they're happy to call him a get refuser. So they're calling him a get refuser because he's refusing with their, their financial request. But he's not a get refuser. He's happy to give him a get. They don't want to accept the get because they want a different financial agreement. Understood. Court ordered. That's not a get refuser. <laughs> a get refuser is somebody who is absolutely refusing to give a get. 
But if, if someone is goes to the base den and tells their wife, um, I'm willing to give a get as long as we have a clear custody agreement, a clear financial agreement, and until that happens that everything else is settled, Most I don't people want to do give that. the get. Most people do that. Yeah. The, and you don't consider that a get refuser? No. The general way that people do it is they go to court, they figure out financial and custody, and he, then, then they, the based in facilitates a get. That's the general way that a divorce is done. And what happens Sometimes by a get Sometimes you refuser? have somebody who says, I'm not going to give you a get unless you give me full custody. And she doesn't want to give full custody because they're her kids. Sometimes you have someone who says, I'll give you a get if you give me a million dollars. The most common one is, I'll give you a get if you give me a million dollars. She doesn't have a million dollars. What's she supposed to do? Mo what, like the basic standard is, I'll give you a get, but you have to forego your ksuba. And that's so standard that rabbis tell women to do that before he even says it. You don't have to just forego your ksuba. I got it. And then there's no financial? No financial obligation. And do you have an issue with that? I think that the get shouldn't be used for extortion. I think it's the, the get wasn't meant to like level the playing field. It's just it's just a document that you have to give her. Just give right, it to but her. do you understand how nuanced that can that can get? No, because there's a court. What is extortion? What is negotiation? Well, there's a court. So okay. go to court of law, figure out your custody, figure out your financials. Don't use the get. She can't use a get. Don't use the get to say, I'll give you a get if you give me these everything that I want. And I'm not going to budge and I'm not going to come to the table and I'm not going to talk to you unless you give me a get and then we can, unless you give me what I want and then I'll give you a get. Right. It's true she can't use the get, but there's a world of a difference between a guy who walks into court and says, my wife hit me and a woman who walks into court and says, my husband there's hit me. There's not anymore. There That's, is. I, I looked into it a lot because I also thought that and it's, I've spoken to a lot of people who work in family court and they were like, it's not a thing anymore. Nowadays, the standard is to give 50-50 custody. If a woman, a woman is considered abusive, they will take her kids away. They will give it to her husband. I know men who have full custody. Right, it's true. There are some men who have full custody. But you don't think that just human nature, when we hear something like that, we come to a different conclusion between the two things? I don't know. Look at Amber Adler and Johnny Depp. The whole world took his side. That's true. <laughs> Everybody was like, you can't I mean, just... she was right. All right, again, she was crazy. But like, right. there's a lot of times where you can tell right away that the woman is yeah, crazy. Yeah, there was a lot of video. There was a lot of everything else. But you can tell when it. a woman comes into court and she's crazy, you can tell. When a man comes into court and he's crazy, you can tell. I have a friend who just went to court yesterday and like he was so obviously crazy that it wasn't even a question for the judge because he just doesn't. They, people can't hide their nature for that. And the people that could are the people that get away with it. Okay, so walk me. So, so there's, there's a few different solutions there's the social solution. There's the rabbinic solution, and then there's the ultimate solution. So there's what is the ideal, which we're not holding there, because before we get there, society has to accept that get refusal is a problem, and that get refusal is something. But before we go to get problem. refusal, I, I want to define it. So let's let's talk first the extremes. Okay. Right. Meaning, give me an example of like the worst kind of get refuser. What is he doing? What where is their financial, their custody? That there is a get refuser, and I can say their name because she's famous, right? So there's Lana Ralbagkin, right? Okay. She's married, or I don't know, her. She was married to. Is American. He has remarried. He lives in Vegas. She, they have a civil divorce. He won't give her a get. What does she, she want? She claims. She says the financial is set, the custody is set, everything is set. He just won't give me a get for no reason. And what he does she want? She claims that he has a get waiting for her in a basin and if she, and it has conditions and if she meets those conditions she can go get her get so me being me <laughs> we looked into this get that's supposedly in a basin first of all we don't know if it exists nobody ever saw it but also the conditions on it are that she remove anything negative about him online from ever ever she can't do that she right. doesn't control the internet she can't do that right it's not a condition it's not a reasonable condition Right, if she can fly. So what did she do? So there's, in the Gemara it says that if a man gives a get with a condition that is unreasonable, and the Gemara gives examples, like let's say if she goes to the moon, which That's, in those okay. days was not That's possible. what I said, if she can fly, yes. The Gemara says that she can take the get without meeting those conditions because he's just trying to be mean. That's so, what the Gemara says. Right. So I, I'm like, okay, so why can't we do that here? So that's where I get frustrated. I'm like, how come we're not doing these things? But people are like, society won't accept it. That's where I get like a little bit annoyed. <laughs> right. 
Okay. I, I don't see. understand why we don't keep it, but we don't. And it's not that the rabbis are telling you we can't keep it. The rabbis it's are like, that... I, look, I work with Rabbi Ullman. I work with my father. My father tells me all the time, he's like, I can give her a psaac, but what's it going to help her? Nobody's going to believe. Nobody's going to. The, the community has to accept it. It's not about it's not the community. Rabbi. It's the guy who's going to marry her. Right. Her second right. husband has to accept it. Yeah. hundred percent. And then nobody's going to marry her. Okay. So and this is one second. So, so this, so this example you gave has based in reviewed the case. Yeah. A lot of based reviewed it. And they've, they've determined he's he a get is, refuser. He is Fine, not so only is he a get refuser. He has a YouTube channel helping people become get refusers. He has a safe house for get refusers to run away to. He's like the, he's Darth Vader. Oh, he's terrible. He's terrible. He made a video on YouTube, like addressing me, because we're like skipping a lot of steps. <laughs> but I made an aganasifa, which is why she told you that I'm the one you should speak to. Basically, I was at this. I I spent two years trying to figure out a way to help these women, and I spoke to a lot of rabbis. And every single rabbi I spoke to was like, I can, I I agree with you, but I can't help you. And it got very frustrating. And eventually, I was like, it got to the point where I realized that a lot of the rabbis don't realize how big of an issue it is and all the women think the rabbis don't care when the rabbis really just don't know what to do so i put together an asifa it was this event we did it in august we had four or five really big rabbis come they spoke we filled the room up with women who are suffering and we live streamed it i think right now it's at like eighteen thousand views mm. and at the time it, like live we had six thousand people watching and these rabbis got up and spoke. And my father was there, Rev Weinberger was there, Rev Ullman was there, and Rev Zev Leff, and Rev Zintorsky. And they got up and spoke, and they discussed. And I gave them to each a topic, so it kind of built on each other. And they discussed um, what the issue is, why we have this issue, and how we could possibly solve it. Now, the one who was speaking about how we could possibly solve it is Rabbi Ullman, and he helps a lot of women get their get. He told me he's before, one from Sydney. So. He's from Sydney. Yeah, I've seen I've seen his name around. Okay. Well, because he he opened the vod. So he told me before the event, he's like, I'm not going to say anything to solve it. I'll explain why it's hard to solve. I'll explain the halachic aspect, but I'm not going to say anything that you want me to say. I was like, whatever. He told me this like as the event was starting. I was like, whatever. He got up and he shared he started speaking and then like halfway through the speech like something happened and he switched and he started talking about opening a vad and saying how if every single one of these women were the daughter of an esteemed rabbi this would have been taken care of because it would have had all of their focus and we should open a, a committee of rabbis that are high tier rabbis that other people listen to all other rabbis listen to that will treat each case as if it's their own daughter after the next morning he called me Everybody was like cheering. It was crazy. And the next morning he called me and he said, I, I, was, I was serious. I want to do this and I want you to be the administrator. And we've been taking cases ever since. And he's been collecting a team of rabbis and we've been helping women. Right. Um, and then at that point they could say, hey, let's say these 20, 30 rabbis have reviewed this and all determined that. It's not that these 20, 30 rabbis have reviewed it. It's like, let's say we have a case in, I don't know, like take a, a random country and she's like this lone wolf and she doesn't have anybody to support her and there's nobody taking care of her. If Rabbi Ullman calls the chief rabbi of that country and that country calls the base in, in her city and they, they're, the fire is lit for them to take care of it. Meaning a lot of times it's just people getting lost between. Complacent. Yeah. yeah, and nobody cares and there's so many cases and they can charge for each time that they have them and like they drag the cases on. A lot of times it's just a matter of nobody caring enough. There's not one person focused on this person and caring because she doesn't have a father who's a rabbi. She doesn't have connections. That's a lot of the time what the issue is. And he started this um, vod. He told me afterwards that the reason that he said it was because he's like he said he was looking at the faces of the women. He, he had to say something. Like it, he changed his mind. He decided oh, <laughs> to I got say you, what he was doing. Um, and we, when we did this Agana Sifa, it was kind of like to mobilize the rabbis. Like, listen, you have to do something. There's like, there's a limit to how much you can just say, I'm not the one, I'm not the one. You have to do something. You have to take some sort of ownership, leadership. Right. And it also, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Meaning, let's say there isn't a solution that solves every single case, but it reduces it by 20, 30%. So, that's a good start. Right. So that's what I was saying about the ultimate solution. So this is not going to solve every case. There's going to be cases that he's not going to be able to solve. But if we raise awareness of 
the community to a place where we don't tolerate get refusal, just like we don't tolerate other kinds of abuse. We don't tolerate this kind of abuse. And we define what it is and we make it really clear. And we there's no gray area. There's nobody who's like, some people think he's abusive, some people not. Like we create a situation where we have a way of defining the abuse, saying this person is abusing this person and we're not going to tolerate it. If as a community we get to that place, then we can think about other things like um, Rev, there was a Rev Eliyahu Hinkin, I think his name was, who was the Rosh Hashiva of Moshe Feinstein. He came up with a solution. And he said that we should add a document to the Ksuba that is a conditional get. So before a man goes to war, they sign a conditional get. We had a lot of guys sign it just now, after October 7th, when the Israeli army had mm -hmm. to go call up all the reservists. A lot of men signed conditional gets. If they don't come back, like if something happens to them, she's divorced. She's not in a gunna. Right. Meaning, this is something that David Amalek made up. Not if something, if, if something unknown if they go missing or something if like that. If they go missing, because a lot of times exactly. they could go missing. Yes. Unfortunately. So um, he kind of adapted that idea. And he said and we what should would put it, it under the chuppah and they should sign it under the chuppah. And it would say that after 12 months, if of 12 months of arbitration, of her trying, of him trying, it would, it would by the way, protect both sides. Um, and the other person is being completely uncooperative. And there's no, and the rabbis have determined that there's like, that he needs that the get needs to be given and there's no good reason and this is a there, there's like a whole list of conditions then this document will serve as the get so you don't have to wait for somebody to give it to you you have it and the most you could be in a gunna is 12 months and like and and it ends up solving like that you don't have this issue to begin with so it's different than the prenup because the prenup the halachic prenup is still asking that he give a get it's just putting financial pressure on him to give it, which doesn't always work. And in this case, like you would have a situation where there is no, there's no such thing as an aguna anymore. The problem is that we are not in a place, our community is not in a place to accept this. We're not in a place to even like understand it. We first have to get to a place where we all agree that it's a bad thing. And we don't all agree. You'd be surprised how many arguments. So, okay, so give me the other arguments. Let me understand this. People say like, oh, this, like he, he parental alienation. He doesn't want to give a get. He shouldn't be forced to give a get. I've had people call me and yell at me that a man has the right to decide that he wants to stay married and there's nothing she could do about it. Not true. But people really value, really, really think this. And the, we're not at a place. We're just not at a place where. So you think a lot of it's educational. A lot of the solutions educational. Yeah. I think a lot of it is educational. The rest of it is rabbinic. And then when we all... So we're starting that we're planning now another asifa, which is going to be only for rabbis and to teach each rabbi how to make, how to eradicate abuse from their community, how to take care of get abuse in their community. So they don't have to do anything on a global scale. They don't have to do anything political, but just what could you do in your community to make sure that there's no issue, which is mainly care about the case before it gets out of hand, before they refuse to mediate before a lot of the time it's, it's just because things got out of hand because there was no communication things people did things that they were like in defense and like if there would have been somebody cool calm and collected in the middle it would have been okay and if a rabbi can care about the people and know how to handle it then you would you would take away like 50 percent of the cases i hear that okay so let's earlier i asked for an example on the extreme of the get refuser mm -hmm. give me um one of the 20 percent of cases where someone would call you and say it's that refuser, but it's it's not. Where you did give an example previously, where you said where they didn't even ask for the get. So obviously, it can't be a get refuser if they didn't ask for the get. Yeah, but somebody, is there another somebody example called where... me that she said her husband, um, her husband got a heter mea, meaning he got permission to get remarried, even though she didn't get her get. Part of heter mea is that they leave a get in a basin, and whenever she wants, she can go pick it up. And she was very upset. She felt like the heter mea is for Rabbi Meir Balanes for the not getting Rabbi married to two women. Yeah, that you can't marry. Sorry. You can't marry um, two women. Right. So many a thousand Which or so a years thousand ago. Thousand years ago. Yeah. He made right. he made a decree decree that you can't marry more than one woman because of like all of the reasons that he had, and this is kind of saying, oh, you can go against that and you can marry two women, so you're still married to her, but you can marry another woman. Oh, so he claimed he got a Hector Mayor bottom. He didn't no, show he anything. Did. Oh, he, he did. got a Hector Man. She was very angry that he got a Hector Man. She felt like it wasn't fair. Got it. I'm like, how long are you divorced? Ten years. Are the, what, where are the kids? They're all grown up and married. What's the problem? He pays me alimony, and I think he should pay me more. And what's the issue? 
she wants him to pay hundreds of thousands in alimony a year and he doesn't and the court doesn't think he should and nobody thinks he should because he so just to be clear a man cannot give a get unless the woman receives it meaning it's got to be both. both it's got to be both the difference is that a man has an out man can do hater mea. a woman can't got it but if a man wants to get divorced and she, if she doesn't want to get divorced they can't get divorced oh i didn't know this right i'm telling you it's education I'm telling you so it's got to, both sides got to agree to kind of annul this contract. Yeah. We both agreed. What do you mean? If I sign you a don't contract get to give me with six you, kids. we both have to get, be let out of the contract. Right. You don't get to give me six kids, 20 years older, and now say, and okay. And then like leave. Leave. I have and to agree to that. And a lot of these people are like, like, let's say like in Chava's case, right? Like, okay, I don't know. I shouldn't talk about specific cases. I'm not going to talk about Chava's case. But let's say you have a case where like the guy is, is left. He doesn't pay child support. He doesn't see his kids. He doesn't have anything to do with the family. He just up and left and won't give her a get because he just doesn't want it. Just doesn't feel like he should. What is, what is she supposed to do? She's a single mom. She has to support her kids. So you're saying the woman can be a get refuser? Both can and be a get refuser. Case, in this case, the woman is the get refuser. Right, but in this case where the woman said, I want more money. He was able to get a He just went and got remarried. Right. It didn't really affect his life. He's fine. Right. It didn't affect... I mean, it, he had to go through a few hurdles, but right. he was able to get through it. He had to pay money to do a hat mail. I was saying it was work, but we don't want to roll our eyes about it because but she, some people, all they had to do was go to you. To get yeah. their get? Yeah, exactly. And you made them crazy. You made everyone crazy. You brought the awareness. I'm sure you helped certain people get a get, right? Yeah, but I'm only doing this for like two years. No, I understand that. But what I'm saying is we don't want to roll our eyes at the other case. A guy shouldn't have to go through that. No, it's different. Either. Why? It's very different. Because when a, when a guy calls up and says, I want a heter mea, he knows that in a month he's going to be free to get remarried. It's when so easy to calls, get 100 rabbis on the line? Literally, all you have to do is pay. It's incredibly easy. How much do you have to pay? It's $18,000. It's a lot of money. Sometimes it's $40,000. It's a lot of money. Depends how strict you want it to be. It is a lot of money, but you have a way out. A woman can call me. I can try my best, but I can never promise. I don't know. There's some women who are never going to get their get. If a guy said to There's a, a woman who just died. And if a guy said to a woman, I'll give you the get if you give me 40 grand, would you call him a get refuser? No, I would call him. I would call that extortion. But if she has the 40 grand, then gives it to him. But like you have people who say, I want 500,000 and then she gives it to him and then he still doesn't give the well, it. Well, it can't be about the amount of money. That's not can't but, really what you're but, saying. Okay, but that she gives him the money and he, does, and he still says no. Or she finds the money and he says, no, never mind. I want more money. Right. I just don't feel like you're, um, like you're acknowledging that a woman can be a get refuser. I just don't feel A like. woman could be a get refuser. But a man is... I'm not even going to say it. I'm going to quote Rabbi Ullman because he said this in front of thousands of people. Go ahead. There's no case of a man who was an agun for 10 years. Got it. Okay. You have cases of women who are agunot for 18 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. You don't have a case of a guy who's an agun for more than three years because at the end of the day, they can get married to a second wife. Got it. Okay, so not that it's not a problem at all, but it'd be crazy for us to be talking about that when we have real problems on the other side. No, I, There's I hurdles. Feel, I feel it's bad for them. Right. It's not great. It's a horrible feeling, um, especially if they want to end on good terms with that. And, and there's also guys who suffer from parental alienation. There's guys who the women claim sexual abuse or physical abuse to the children, and they can't see their kids, and they're court-ordered away from their kids. Women do crazy things. I'm not saying women aren't crazy, but I'm talking about halakhically. Halakhically, she, he has an out, and she doesn't have an out. Got it. So part of the way this conversation came about was because uh, there was a podcast going around with Mislabeled and um, Adina Flappish Girl mm -hmm. right after, I guess it was right after the Sasifa. Or right I think it was the around time. the same time, yeah. Yeah, around the same time. But, and um, on there, I mean, Adina... I don't know if what she said was her opinion. Like, I kind of felt watching um, the interviews, you know, and I like the mislabeled guys. I think they're cool in a lot of ways. But they're funny, they're entertaining, you know, respect for them. But in this particular case, the way he was interviewing her, I thought was a little bit gotcha in the sense that 
you're not actually going to get someone's real opinion if you put them on the defensive in that way. And, you know, so I don't know if Adina actually meant what she said, where it kind of felt to me, I mean, not felt to me, she wasn't breathing and he was coming down on her real. He wasn't being nice to her. No, I agree. That's what I'm saying. All I said was, you got a little tense about it. All I said was, I, I don't, don't like hate them. the guys. I, can't, I get that. <laughs> I'm saying, I don't hate the guys. I happen to disagree. I like them. I happen to disagree with this. Um, the interview didn't go well. It wasn't a good, yeah. I, I felt like he wasn't drawing out her truth because of the way he was going into gotcha. So she right. stopped breathing. So I don't know. She was like answering his questions rather than saying what she wanted to exactly. say. Yeah. Exactly. It kind of turned into retorts. And so I don't know if this was her position, but one of the things she did say was that there's never a case where a man should be able to use the get in any negotiation whatsoever under any circumstances. You're clearly not saying the same thing. I am saying the same thing. You're saying within the basin, if he wanted to say something. That's not, for using, that first... that's not using the get as negotiation, though. That's the process of divorce. A process of divorce is that you figure out financial, you figure out custody, you give a get. Yeah, that was his exact question on the podcast. Meaning right. he asked, I, I he's like, what about parental alienation? What about if he's trying to get custody? What about all of those things? She's like, no, it can't even be introduced. And you're saying, no, but introduce it within the base then and have that as part of the right. conversation. So you have a process. You don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. There's a process. Follow the process. There's a process. You figure out financials, you figure out custody, and then you give a get. However, if you have a situation where you figured out financials and you figured out custody, the court agreed, or you're asking for unreasonable demands, and the Basin tells you. And the Basin is determined to, for it to be unreasonable. The Basin gave up sock that you have to give her a get, which the Basin does. And the Basin says, you have to give her a get. And he says, I'm not giving her a get until she gives me what I want. Because, and this is the claim that they all say, once I give her a get, I'm never going to see my kid again. Once I give her a get, I'm never going to hear from her again. That's not how it works. You have to go to court. A woman cannot just not let her husband see the kids. That's not how it works. You can't just go to Canada. It's called kidnapping. We have law. We, have a, we live in a country that has laws. If you don't like the custody agreement that you got in court and based in, go to court. But don't take something that's religious, that has nothing to do with the custody, nothing to do with finances, and start using it retroactively as a bargaining chip to get what you want. Understood. But within the context of if the... If everything goes according to plan, the finances and custody should be figured out right. before they get. Meaning, if a woman went to a man and said, went to her husband and said, I want a divorce today, right? Maybe she fell in love with another guy and she has somewhere else she can run right okay. away. And he's like, hold, hold the line a little bit. Let's go to Baston. Let's sort this out. Let's figure out what we're doing with the kids, what we're doing with um, financials before we talk about a divorce. I'm not letting you go run off with this other guy just yet. Yeah, I want to sort this out. Abuse. You're okay with that. That's what every single person does. Okay, so you're saying that that's a reasonable approach. Um, Look at the secular and if world. A woman if you're going to get call, divorced, they first figure out the custody and the finances before they finalize the divorce, right? Even I think in, so, yeah. In the civil court, yeah, that's yeah, what they so. do. Right. Yeah. Okay, but that didn't seem to be on the podcast – that um, a reference between mislabeled was when I say mislabeled, it was specifically label who was bringing up this point because Zach and Zach certainly seemed to agree with Adina on some points, but label specifically asked her this question and she was like, "No, for a guy to use it in any context whatsoever, I'm not okay with." You're not saying that, but you you're have saying to, in the basin within the basin, you're okay. If you go and do the process of divorce, he's not using it as a bargaining chip. It's just. You, you do the process. First you do A, then you do B, then you do C. He's not saying, I'm not going to give you a get until we figure out finances and custody. He's just saying, let's figure out finances and custody. Well, my understanding of her... One second. When you're yeah. using it as a bargaining chip, you're saying, we figured out finances, but I don't want to pay you that much. So I'm not going to give you a get until you agree to my financial. You're using it. You're I using understand. the get to get what you want. It's no, meaning, meaning you've gone to a third party, you've gone to a court, and they've came to, came to a termination. And now you're trying to use that as additional... Leverage, I agree with that. That's inappropriate. That's abuse. Yes. That's, but you've doing gone through a process, process, you submit it to yourself. Divorce is not abuse. Process. That's just the due process of divorce. By the way, a lot of women are frustrated with it. A lot of women have called me and been like, I don't care that we didn't finalize the financial and the custody. I want to move on and it's taking a long time and I want to move on. And like, I get them, I understand them, but, but that's these not things how take it time. works. Right. These you have take time. to first finalize your divorce. And if he's being cooperative and he's, it's just that things take time, like it's been a few months, like there's, it sucks, but like give it a give it a little bit of time. Don't don't like get women are also terrified to be agunot. Like women have straight up 
Women call me before they even tell their husband they want a divorce. They're so scared that they're going to be trapped. And they come out already on the defense and already fighting. And a lot of times that pushes the man to the defense. And then there's like this like whole lack of communication that could have been solved. And, and we work with mediators. And you're, so your advice to those women are what? Go to mediation. Calm down. Don't, just because other men did it doesn't mean that your husband's going to do it. And right. Most men give the divorce. Most of these work out. Majority of men yeah. give a gap. Right. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that even with what you're saying, that the community doesn't jump on board and doesn't give support, it doesn't look good for someone to be called a get, get refuser. No matter what the situation is, okay. the details don't really matter. You've kind of been branded a little bit of a rapist. I mean, just the way We're getting it's, there. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Uh, certainly but over the last... I think that's a good thing. What? I think that's a good thing. So like anything else, right? It's a good thing, and it's a tool that shouldn't be misused, meaning the fact that a guy can be imprisoned for rape is great. The fact that a guy can be socially ostracized for rape is great. But the fact that someone can just be accused by someone else without anything ever happening for rape, that's something it's we got to deal with as well. That's not great. So it, it seems to me, based on this conversation with you, that some of that does happen, where sometimes a guy is branded very quickly as a get refuser when it's not, it's not the case. It happens, but it's, it's very much the minority. Like the majority of cases. Well, well, those men aren't calling you. No, but their wives are. No, the, <laughs> the wife who's... The, the My wife, wife who's a get refuser because they think they want me oh, to help. Oh, I got it. They want I me to it. help them. They say, I, I want I my it. get, but I also want this. I'm like, okay, well, he's offering you a get. It's different. Right. It's a different level of priority, right? Agunas is a real issue. Women being held hostage by men simply because they want to. I'm telling you, I can tell you right now, 13 women that I'm right now dealing with whose husbands have no logical, normal reason to not give a get except that they are just insane. Literally. There's no other reason. Okay. And there's, you're dealing with crazy people. So who there's... Do crazy things. But... There is a real problem of women crying me too, of women, there is a problem of that, of women doing it, but that's a different problem. It shouldn't be, it's not, there. they can They can both exist at the same time. This one doesn't cancel out that one. 100%, I'm just. So a lot of, no. I'm just trying to right, lay out the. But what they were doing to her and what a lot of people do is they try to squash down the Aguna movement by saying, but what about parental alienation? But there are both and they both exist and they're both horrible. I'm not going to solve parental alienation now. Maybe I'll solve that next. But right yeah. now, I'm trying to work on this problem. Right, don't take, right, don't take don't you off take of that. Don't take away from it. I mean, the, po the point you made that was very compelling is that even within, we're not asking for something that's beyond the U.S. civil system right. at this point. Right? We're not right. challenging the whole civil system. Within the civil system, someone can't get a divorce in 30 minutes. Right. right? There is a process that we go through. And we're saying, we've gone through all that process. All that has been done and everything else. And you want the last thing to be hanging out, which is this get. The man has an out in that process, and the woman has no out. And what you'd like to do is even the playing field a little bit so that the man, so the woman has an out for. Yeah, basically. Okay. If a woman wants to get divorced, she should be allowed to get divorced. Right. I, I think there's no problem right. with it. Right. Like, yeah, it makes sense. She shouldn't have to like wait for him to give her permission to leave. Okay, so there's I not... will say one thing, though, that I, um, this was totally like not even so related, but it was bothering me. One of the women asked me it was very very hard for her to there was a naguna who passed away she was older she passed away she never got her divorce and she passed away still chained to this man and one of the girls who i work with messaged me and she was like am i if i die and i'm still married to him am i going to have to spend eternity with him is my soul still connected to his soul and she was bugging like really bugging she's like this man is a terrible man I do not want to be associated with him in the world to come and I called my father, and I, my father knows, like, Kabbalah, and he's, he's big, Tamar Chacham. So I called him, and I was like, okay, like, what's the deal? <laughs> and he, he said, no, once you're separated, once you're no longer doing things that married couples do, you're not living together, you're not sleeping together, you're not eating meals together, like, there's no relationship. You're divorced, your soul is divorced from his soul. You've moved on. Your soul's divorced. The get is literally permission to be with another man it's just saying i'm no longer with you and any child you have from here on out is not mine i'm not that's literally what the get is and he was like it's just a document 
And it just it's just she can be divorced without ability to remarry. And right now she's in the middle. She doesn't have the ability to remarry yet. But she's completely separated from him because she they 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 don't they're not doing the, he's not fulfilling his ksuba, right? He's not doing the three things in the ksuba. Which is just like something that like always like but know, it's an interesting it question. It calms me down a little bit because I'm like, okay, at least like their neshamas are not like <laughs> enmeshed and like, ugh. I don't know. Right. I hear. I hear, the, <laughs> I hear the question. I hear the answer. Um, I don't want this question to come out the wrong way. So hear the full thing before you um, respond. But you had mentioned that one of the challenges is that a woman could be afraid that they're going to end up in a guna. And if they do, and because they're so worried about it, they may from the outset create some sort of, put the guy in the defensive from day one and actually create the reality. Yeah. Do you feel like you might be feeding into that in some way? Meaning as part of the publicity of the Aguna crisis, right, which has a lot of its benefits, do you feel like there may be also, there's a risk attached to that, that you're also creating anxiety amongst women that this may get there? No. Why not? Because the anxiety exists. You Every think... single woman is aware of the fact that when she gets married, she's basically signing her life away to this man and hoping that he treats her well. What I do think, though, is a risk is that men are going to get ideas because I, I've asked people for money when I was raising money for the Asifa, and I've had to educate people about what an aguna is. And then... I've had those same people turn around and give advice to men, which was don't give again until you have everything you want. I've had met, like I've seen situations where men were like, oh, wait, I could do this. And then all of a sudden they became gay refusers because they realized what they're able to do. Ooh. Yeah. So I am worried about that. That, worried about that sits on my heart. But I'm not worried that I'm creating anxiety because every single woman has this anxiety. Right. What you're saying is that kind of from from day one, a woman is going into a marriage, and Listen, she's taking I'm a bigger married, risk. But I, it definitely was a, like it's. I definitely the have thought about it. Right. The fact of the matter is that whether you like your husband, respect him, or anything else, the fact is that there's a risk attached to it. That's the fact. And 100%. he doesn't carry that same risk. He does not. Carries other risks. He doesn't carry that risk. He carries other risks, but he doesn't carry that one. Right. Of course, he carries other ones. I mean, I, nobody financially, like, is, like living in this world without any worries or anxieties. No, no. Financially, um, men carry a. Yeah, especially if they're coming from money and they're scared that yeah. she's going to take them for yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Men, men, men carry much larger risk than the woman does in a lot of ways. Right? But not in the soul level. This is like a soul level. Right, this no, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything, meaning it has to be sorted out. It's that, and I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is, is that it's a, it's a very une, uneven setup, right? The, both of, two parties have to agree to divorce. Yeah. One guy according has an out. Torah. According to the Torah. two parties have to agree to divorce. Mm -hmm. One person has an out. And one person doesn't. And that out is not super convenient, right? So in some sense, it's good, right, that it's not super convenient, the out for the man is not super convenient because it forces him to kind of sit through the process. I can't tell I think you how that's good though. I that's think, a very good thing. I think one of the reasons that men have to give a get is because if we're going back to the beginning of our conversation where everything Hashem does is for a reason, mm -hmm. um, is because men, when a woman asks for a divorce, she already went through the entire process of trying to save the marriage, grieving the marriage, accepting that the marriage is over. And generally speaking, the man is waking up when she asks for the divorce. And generally, they need closure, and the get gives them that closure. And a lot of times, like, they just don't have the closure that the marriage is over. I think Amen. it's, yeah, I think that men's brains work differently. This isn't something, this is something that one of the Rabbanim I spoke to told me, that men's brains work a little differently. And the, the, the fact of sitting down, going through the custody, going through the finances, the whole process of giving a get is very, like, weird. And I think that, it's almost like a mourning period for their It gives them the chance the to like accept that the marriage is over. And a lot of men who don't give a get say that they're not giving a get because they want her to come back. Because they, they want Shalom bias or because they think she made a mistake in leaving. Or she's just not a good wife. She needs to learn how to be a good wife. It right. In other words, they haven't given common. up. They haven't given up. 
in a in a sick way. I mean, some, for some of them, it's been ten years. Like she's not right. coming back, but in a sick, like in a in a twisted way, they they they're not. I mean, it's ready a perfectly appropriate them. response for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So the process gives you that time. Right. If you're gonna still be an idiot after that time, then we're gonna have to do something to force you to give it. I got you. Okay. And your answer to all of this is just. Listen, everyone has positions from here till forever. Everyone thinks they're right from here till forever. Every case is but also either, different. Like, sure, but either we submit ourselves to a rule of law or we don't. In other words, there are many people who, when they go into a court case, let's say, and they lose, they feel that they're right, right? They 100%. Happens. They feel that they're right. It happens all the time. They feel that they're right. But nevertheless, there will be a higher voice that comes out and says, while I do in my heart believe I'm right, I also recognize that a greater good than my individual case is a societal good of having a rule of law that everyone follows to because if it just devolved into what someone thinks is right, we have anarchy and chaos and destruction. So that person who's thinking will actually willingly give the other party the money that he doesn't want to get, that he doesn't think he owes because the greater good is society working. My so father, that's what you're my saying. My father once lost a case in based in. There was like a, I think it was a question. I was a little girl, so I don't fully remember. But there was a question about like a book he wrote and who was the owner. Mm -hmm. um, and he lost. And he very much thought he should win. Like right, he wrote the book. You should win. But he also understood that there's a based in. And if the based in said it, then this is what we do, whether you agree or not. Right. What's more right. And that's right. the thing with the serum, by the way, that people are always like, well... That just because there's a serum, but like, no, there's a serum. You need to respect the serum. Right. Meaning if you want to overthrow the basin, so overthrow the basin, say this guy doesn't belong in basin. But as long as, right. right, as long as they are. No, I definitely think that there should be some sort of due process and something that can like, you know, some sort of something that the basin's answer to, because right now there isn't. There should yeah. be some sort. I, I definitely. That what? There's some way of like making sure that the basins are acting morally sure. correct because they don't a lot of them don't and i, I understand that's I, like a whole different issue and it definitely needs a solution i understand that issue and that doesn't only but, happen but if you're at a, let's say you're in the crc okay like, like the crc is the chicago based in it's very well respected everybody knows that they're very okay they're very just they're very kind if they gave you a psaac you listen to the psaac right you do what and listen say. and I've, I've experienced that as part of based in process i i had a case that once went to based in um and in that process, it worked against me for it to stretch out. And kind of, there was no benefit to a ruling if it took too long. Okay. Right? It's, uh, without going to the details, right? Imagine there's um, a dispute over who owns the tickets to a concert that's happening in a month. If Basin waits longer than a month. It's like a time sensitive matter. Right. So there was, okay. and if, if one party is holding that today, those tickets, like, and let's say I believe I, 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 these concert tickets belong to me, and I bring this guy to Baston, and I tell Baston that they belong to me, I would like these concert tickets. If they rule in two months, then that guy has the tickets, he's going to the concert, right? Right. So meaning you can't actually get, do the case justice if it's not fleshed out in the short term. In order, in order to actually give the example, I'd have to share some personal details, which I have no interest in this case because okay, it involves someone else. But over there, I was frustrated with that. And I kept saying to the basin, like, you have to rule. Like, we've given you all the information. I'm not getting answers. I'm not getting responses. No one's returning my calls. No one's returning to my emails. And as time passes, it works against me. You're basically ruling against me without ever finding a ruling. And it took months and months and months to eventually get a, a ruling. And I was disappointed. And I, I saw that. I didn't think that was professional at all to just so not even get a response. So a lot of women have this problem that, like, they call a basin. And the, even just to send, in order to do a syrup, you have to you have to first come. There's three asmanos. They have to make a psaac. Then there has to be three. There's such a long process. And if they wait six months between each step, which a lot of them do, then you can end up being in Aguna for five years just because of the process. Right. That is a much, much, much larger issue. Which is a whole different issue. But that's, it is, it's an and, issue. Right, it needs to be solved. Yeah, it's that's an, a much, much larger issue um, around basins, which involve much more than um, Agunas. Agunas. And it's the sense I've always got when dealing with any basin whatsoever, any basin across the board, is that they're doing me some sort of favor by taking the case. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, literally. That's been that's, that's what Rabbi Ullman is basically trying to do is like kind of like go up a step above and like just from the top down solve the cases instead of waiting for each individual basin to do the right thing. 
Because a lot of the women get lost through, get like fall through the cracks. Right. So he's like trying to. My father wants to. He's he was telling me he's like you, we need a Sanhedrin. Like, <laughs> like Mashiach can't come if we don't have a Sanhedrin, because the Sanhedrin has to nominate Mashiach. So we can't we can't have Mashiach without Sanhedrin. Right. It's it's a problem. You know, even earlier when I said that. You know, we can overthrow the basin. What I meant was not the concept of basin, like a specific basin. But some people feel they've done that. Like I know where I grew up in Crown Heights, there were certain half of Crown Heights agreed, okay, this guy's considered a rub. The other half of Crown Heights thought uh, a rub was uh, more worthless than anyone else, right? So they would have not respected at all a ruling right. from, that's another from that. Issue. So that's another issue. Because you can have a basin that issues a syrup, and then you can have another basin that says that basin can't issue a syrup, and then you end up in this like weird like fight between basins that. Meanwhile, the woman's still stuck. <laughs> right. Do you understand what I mean when I say we live in dark times? Meaning that in certain ways we've There's not supposed not to be evolved, basins we've developed. I'm not supposed to have basins. What There's supposed not supposed to be basins without Sanhedrin. Like, officially. So what should we have? We're not supposed to have it, but we have it because to, to function, we have to have it. But they're not they're not the same type of basins. Right. They don't have that had. authority. They don't have the They don't authority. have the same authority. No. Right. Right. Okay. I mean, so... You explained why it's complex. It's certainly. so complex. Yeah. And every case is so complex. Every case is so different and has such a different history and different things they tried. And it's a complex issue. Right. I do think that. So it can't, it can't exactly fit on a, a billboard, but you're trying to bring awareness to, to your side of, to this side of the issue, essentially. Yeah, because I think that awareness is where we are falling. Meaning, I think, awareness and education right like i think that if the whole jewish community under or the whole orthodox community understood what get abuse is and who's a get refuser and how does based and decide that someone's a get refuser and what to do with them then we wouldn't have an issue like rabbi omen says he's like well, they don't have an issue in sydney because they're such a small community and if he puts out a thing everybody listens and she gets her get in two weeks right so it's not an issue but we're not there so that's why we're doing this Asifa now for rabbis, which is to get each rabbi to take to take care of his community and make it make it an intolerable excuse in his community. And slowly, eventually, it will hopefully be Got everywhere. It. Okay, what is clear, and I think comes to you when you talk, is that there's a number of women in an incredible amount of pain over this issue. And that were people to address it from that perspective, that there's an individual person who's in an incredible amount of pain. And if you just put them a little bit closer to you, like you quote a real man, whether it's a daughter. That's what happened. He daughter. was looking at them and he was like, okay, I have to, like, he came with the one expectation and then seeing all the faces, he literally changed what he was doing because he, he couldn't, he couldn't face the pain. There's so much pain. Like I, I'm telling you, like I've only been doing this two months since that I started taking calls and it's just like, oh, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. The amount of pain that these women are going through, it's like, horrible <laughs> there's no other word for it there's it's just like they're they're dealing you're dealing with people who don't use logic and reason so like even anything you try like they're they're just constantly like doing something out of left field that makes no sense and you're just you're just in this constant state it's not just about like oh i'm my soul is connected to his soul it's like you're constantly in a state of war with this other person and you just want to move on and you can't move on because they keep on like bothering you it's horrible got it understood Okay, your mission to me sounds admirable. Sounds mm, like you have a level you. head about it. I, uh, I hope that you're successful. I hope that it helps. Amazing. And if someone disagrees, by all means, this is our first conversation we're having here on this, um, on this subject. Someone who disagrees with you is happy to take this chair and um, yeah, try to talk. I'd be, yeah. I'd be interested. What? I'd be very interested. Yeah, but I, I found your perspective uh, nuanced, cautious, and uh, appropriate. So. Thank you. All right. Any final thoughts or? I think that was it. Am I supposed yeah. to have final thoughts? <laughs> so question. Do you want people to take your position on simple faith or to really understand the reasons behind it? I don't have a position on simple I'm kidding. I was just faith. connecting. I was just, no, I know. I want people to ask questions. You want people to, okay. 100%. Good. That's what it seems like. This is my entire mission in life. Right now, this has become your, uh, your purpose, your mission. No. It's like, 10% of my life. Oh, just about asking questions. The questioning the answers is a big part of my life, yeah. Got it. Okay. So you're saying as well, you're inviting people to do that with you as well. 
Always. And I always say that. I always say, don't talk about me behind my back. Just tell me how you feel so I can answer. Got it. Okay, so you want that. You're inviting that. I I would much prefer that somebody come and confront me than just think thoughts about me or talk about me. Right. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I get to challenge you. You get to challenge me. Yeah. Okay, respect. Sure. Thank you so much for uh, for joining. Thank you.